Okay. You're waving me in. They I'm say so. <laughs> Good evening, thank you. everybody, and, and thank you so much for being here. Um, when we uh, imagined that, when we decided that the best way to commemorate Purdue's 150th would be to try to um, uh, build a, uh, a, a continuous stream of uh, brilliant and talented and knowledgeable people who would bring um, uh, fresh ideas, the newest technology, uh, the newest insights uh, to us, uh, we couldn't have done better than tonight's guest. Uh, tonight's guest is a, uh, let me count the ways, uh, an eminent journalist, an author, obviously a, a scholar, a media executive, a CEO uh, at the Aspen Institute, an investment banker, and uh, when he called upon, he's been a public servant too. Uh, so there are, uh, there's a very long list of, of uh, topics that uh, uh, we uh, can ask him about, and I'll ask some, and then the last uh, stretch, uh, as we often do, uh, you can uh, ask uh, questions at these two microphones. But uh, let's get started. Please thank me, uh, help me in thanking our guest tonight, thank Walter you. Isaacson. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. And thanks Walter, for having me. Walter was teaching. He, he didn't need to do this. It's an incredibly gracious thing uh, that he has shared this day with many of our students and now with you. Uh, he was teaching yesterday at Tulane University. He'll be teaching tomorrow. And so uh, you'll, uh, you'll understand uh, why I'm so very grateful to him for making this time available. Um, Walter, uh, your uh, books, I'll bet everyone in the audience has read some, if not all of them. Um, and. Uh, well, in our audience, uh, including faculty, and I hope many of our students uh, either have or aspire to write books themselves. Would you just take a minute or two and talk about the process, the, the uh, meticulous research that you do, and how that may have changed over the decades in which you've been writing uh, uh, bestseller after bestseller? Well, one of the things I do is I tend to write narrative biographies, mm -hmm. which means there's a central character and it starts at the beginning and it goes to the end. It's chronological. And that makes it kind of simple because you know, you're not having to make it a complex sort of formula, et cetera. So what I do, whether uh, the person's alive, as in the case of Steve Jobs, or has been gone a long time, like Leonardo, is I start with the primary research, the person's notes, the person's memos, if I can, the interviews, and I just put it all chronologically. Mm -hmm. Because one of the, the two things, and we were talking about it in one of the classes here today, two things happened to the study of history when I was a student. And uh, don't take this wrong, members of the academy, but what happened was biography fell out of favor. Mm -hmm. It was sort of, oh, we're telling the story through powerful people, you know, mm -hmm. that was, and said we had to have a people's history of everything. Right. I had a wonderful history teacher who has probably been on this stage, but back then her name was Doris Kearns. She mm -hmm. hadn't yet married Dick Goodwin, and she was not tenured. This shows how old I am. <laughs> and she taught me American history. And for her dissertation and her first publication, she wrote a biography, Lyndon Johnson, The American Dream. Mm -hmm. And they didn't give her tenure because it was considered beneath the dignity of the academy to do. So for a long time, for 20, 30 years, until academics went back into the field of biography, it was people like me, David McCullough, John Meacham, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Bob Caro, people who were not academics got to write narrative biography. And to me, it's good because the best, I mean, the Bible does it this way. We tell our lessons through people and their stories. Right. And when I start a book, I just say, okay, let's start with where this person was born and let's move and let's figure out how they learn because that's what happens when you do it chronologically. Somebody who's 20 knows a little bit less than when they're 30 and you show how they accumulate the creativity that allows them to be innovative. Have all the new tools, uh, uh, digitization and all the rest, made the job easier, uh, more complicated? No difference. 
Well, it's uh, made sometimes the historical research different. There's a, uh, my first book, which nobody remembers, I did with a friend from college. It's called The Wise Men. It's about six friends in the uh, 1940s. Yeah, no, you were not one, but you should have been. <laughs> no, I, uh, no, no, I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, six friends in the 1940s, three Democrats, three Republicans, who helped figure out our Cold War policy, the Marshall Plan, et cetera. Sort of Harriman, Atchison, mm -hmm. Bowen, that crap. So Harriman and Atchison are actually, and uh, Lovett, are all three <laughs> banking partners. Mail was delivered twice a day back then. Mm -hmm. So when Lovett and Harriman are in New York, but Atchison's down in Washington, they'd write twice a day, and you'd see, okay, tell me about this, tell me about that. Technologically, there's a moment in 1959, you can almost mark it, where direct long distance dialing comes uh. in. And suddenly in the Brown Brothers Harriman archives where I went and was doing all these things, the daily letters, the twice a day letters stop and you just get, call me about Vietnam. You go, darn, we're losing the thread here. Cause right. And likewise, we were talking backstage, you know, Nixon and Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy taped themselves, but Nixon messed that up for the uh. rest of us. So you, know, <laughs> so you lose those technological things but we gain things such as emails. Now that's going to be a trove someday. Right. I hope somebody other than the Russian intelligence services are keeping track <laughs> of all of our emails. Maybe Google is keeping them for us because that will be how we write history in the future. Let's see if we can sell some books and sure. uh, let's uh, do a little lightning round. Uh, right. There may be, uh, there probably will be questions about these later, but just. Um, just a, a word or two about the, the subjects of, of your books. We'll take them in more or less the order you wrote them. Just sort of maybe a defining characteristic that, uh, that comes to mind. So Ben Franklin. So Ben Franklin was part of the greatest team ever made, which is our founders. Right. And you had to have really people <coughs> of grand stature, like Washington. You had to have really smart people, like Madison and Jay or whatever. You had to have very passionate people, like John Adams and Sam Adams. But if you're going to make a team, a leadership team, you have to have the person who can bring them together, cool them all down, and say, all right, here's the common ground. Here's what we're going to do. Franklin was that person. He's a person that you and my mentor, when I went to graduate school, Dick Luger, your mm -hmm. mentor as well from here, Dick Luger used to always teach this, which was that compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. Uh -huh. That was a line of Ben Franklin's, and we've lost that today. And Ben Franklin was sort of a glue that tried to hold us together. Was that at Pembroke College, or where was We it? were at Pembroke. Yeah. I was the co-chair with uh, Dick Luger uh -huh. of the Pembroke Society, which was, as you would know as a college uh, university president, basically a fundraising group. <laughs> <laughs> Well, My job was to introduce Senator Luger we and, don't say, have those here. and then afterwards say, <laughs> yeah. if you want yeah. to contribute to a poor college. <laughs> yeah, well, I omitted it from my, my uh, uh, too short uh, introduction of Walter, but he is the living proof that Rhodes Scholars actually can amount to something. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. They're a dime a dozen. Who yeah. else went to Pembroke College? Stumped. Pete Buttigieg. Oh, well, okay. So he was on the Pembroke. This is a very small college. You go to Oxford on tour, they show you Christ Church, they show you Maudlin. Then they kind of walk by and say, you've seen the rich and grand colleges, now we'll show you a poor little college. Well, not poor in tradition, as you just <laughs> proved. Dr. Johnson went there. So, uh, we so then uh, uh, Einstein. Einstein. Yeah, when I did Ben Franklin, you know, we think of him as a doddering old dude flying a kite in the rain going, you know. Uh, those electricity experiments were phenomenally important. And they're, the reason I loved writing about Franklin is they inform all that he does. Mm -hmm. Plus, minus, checks, balances, you know, Newtonian mechanics, but also the flow of electricity, batteries. All this you almost see in the Constitution, these checks and balances and um, balances of power when he does his diplomacy. He and his friend Thomas Jefferson would have thought you were a Philistine if you didn't know science and biology mm -hmm. and Newton mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We lose that in about 1920 in history, and it's partly because of Einstein. Suddenly, Einstein comes along, and 
you don't believe you can really grasp science? I mean, uncertainty principles and relativity. Right. And C.P. Snow writes about the two cultures, meaning those who love the humanities don't understand the sciences. And I found that that was problematic because my father, my grandfather were all engineers and scientists. And so I wanted to try to demystify science. Mm. And plus, I just loved Einstein and the beauty, the beauty of relativity as the coolest theory ever done. And uh, we, one, of our, one of your predecessors uh, at, uh, during this year of, of accelerated uh, programming here, uh, it was the scientist who most recently proved um, the um, validity of the relativity theory. Oh, was the, the, they did with the, um, the Higgs boson yes, or the uh, gravity waves? The gravity waves, yes. So yeah, I mean, the thing I love about Einstein is once every two years, there's going to be a headline saying, Einstein proved wrong. Something goes faster than the speed of light. Or Einstein proved wrong this. Yeah. And I look at my watch and I say, let's wait 48 hours. Yeah. And then the next story comes out saying, oh no, they've discovered it was gravity waves and it is actually a force field and it doesn't travel faster than the speed of light. And that's what that was. It's not apocryphal, is it, that, that he uh, was uh, uh, eager for people to try to disprove oh, his yeah. theory, that he wrote to some of his, to Bohr and some of the, his other colleagues, please do an experiment If you that ever prove me really wrong. want an intellectual in exercise, yeah. and I tried to do it, the Niels Bohr, um, Albert Einstein uh -huh. dialogues, both in person, because right. they met three or four times a year at Solvay conferences, and their letters, because what happens is Einstein in 1905, I mean, they call it the miracle year, and that's mm -hmm. understating it. He does relativity, he does quantum theory, mm -hmm. he wins a Nobel for the electro um, uh, mag mag magnetic wave that right. falls into quantum theory, and then at the very end, he does an addendum after a summer, E equals MC squared, basically, <laughs> comes out of it. So he's got it all, but the problem is relativity theory and quantum don't reconcile very mm -hmm. well. It's hard to have a unified theory that puts them together. And the worst part about it to Einstein was that quantum theory left things at the subatomic level to chance, yeah. that there was not a pure certainty or predictability or certainty in nature. That's what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is. Einstein just could not abide that. God does not play dice or something like that? Yeah, yeah give yeah. the line. Yeah. I cannot but, believe that God plays dice with yeah. the universe he says to Niels Bohr. The greatest comeback to that line, finally, after Einstein being Einstein, he said it like 20 times, it's driving Bohr nuts and they're at a conference. He fought, uh, Niels Bohr, because it means, you know, I can't believe that things would happen by chance. Finally, Bohr turns to Einstein and says, Einstein, please quit telling God what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this uh, confirmation bias era we're living in, I frequently cite uh, him yeah. to our students. Here's someone who wanted someone to contradict him or to disprove him if they could. Mm -hmm. And one was eager to have his that own ideas challenged and tested. I wrote him. about Leonardo, and I'll soon we'll yeah. get to him. But the thing that Leonardo, Ben Franklin, and Einstein share is Leonardo's probably the first grand figure to understand the scientific method, uh -huh. which is all right, we've learned about the flood, we've learned about the biblical flood. The Renaissance is not. Uh, they don't know they're in the middle of the beginning of the Renaissance, so they don't know that they can be sacrilegious. And he's looking at fossil levels, and he's saying, well, wait, let me test this out. Let me see how many layers there are. Let me see when things were deposited. And he uses the scientific method and keeps challenging people to disprove him, and they often do. And he changes his theory when things turn out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So does Ben Franklin. And so does uh, Einstein. Yeah. Although Einstein, he thought he was proven wrong truly only once, which is he has the general theory of relativity. And if you look at the general theory, or if you're Einstein and you look at it, maybe <laughs> not me, but it basically says this th theory of general relativity can't have a stable universe. If these equations are right, the universe has to be expanding. And we all knew the universe wasn't expanding. You looked up, it wasn't expanding. <laughs> so he finally puts in what he calls the cosmological constant, which keeps the equations right and the universe from expanding. And then 10 years later, he's brought to the Hubble telescope, and they have discovered that the universe is, is expanding. 
And he said his greatest blunder was thinking that he had made a great blunder. <laughs> <laughs> Would that we could all feel like that. Yeah. Uh, well, any more about uh, Leonardo? Uh, that, we'll take him next. Is anything? Well, you know, when we look at, uh, and I don't mean this to sound preachy, but it's something I discovered as I was writing about, and writing around here, I was thinking about it too. I walk campus. Why do certain places become cradles of creativity? And obviously the greatest is Florence in mm -hmm. 1470 when Leonardo arrives as a teenager. Uh, 1770 when Philadelphia and Ben Franklin, you know, has been there as a runaway. Uh, the Bay Area of California in 1970 when mm -hmm. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs all arrive. And part of it is a, you know, we, we talk about diversity as if it's, mm -hmm. you know, we just run, run up the flagpole and salute it, but we don't think about what it really means. Leonardo da Vinci was illegitimate, much to his um, delight, because that meant he didn't have to be a notary like his father and grandfather. <laughs> um, but he was also a total misfit. He was illegitimate, he was left-handed, he was gay, he was out and gay, which in 1470 is pretty early. Um, <laughs> he wore purple tunics, he was distracted, he, you know, he had all these quirks. And so he comes from the small village, like a lot of people might, you know, even today, to go to the sophisticated city of Florence. And they love him. The Medici family loves him. They embrace him. He becomes, you know, the boy wonder of the town. And that moment, all sorts of people coming into Florence. Constantinople has just fallen. So people coming from the Arab world bringing algebra, which helps them be able to figure out, oh, perspective. And Brunelleschi's building the dome using algebra. And you have Gutenberg, who couldn't get his printing shop working in, um, in Germany well. And so the print indus printing industry, I mean, Gutenberg's first shop is the year Leonardo's born. So people coming in doing the printing industry in Florence. So that intellectual ferment of different types of people in a cradle of some, not only tolerance, but amusement, love, respect, causes Florence to be the place the Renaissance is born. I think you may have just an anticipated, maybe answered one of my other questions, but before I ask it, yeah. uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Well, Steve was also a bit of a misfit, adopted and learns that he was rejected by his first adopted family. But he's somebody who stands at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. After I did Franklin, then Einstein, I got a call from Steve Jobs. I didn't know him real well, but I'd met him before, especially in 1984 when they bring the first Macintosh to Time Magazine, I'm like the newest reporter there. I'm the only guy at Time Magazine who has a computer, who uses one. Mm -hmm. So the old editors had to bring me upstairs to meet this guy because they needed one. So after that, Steve Jobs was my best friend twice a year whenever he had a new product out uh -huh. that he wanted good coverage <laughs> in Time Magazine. So at some point after I'd written these books, I got a call from Steve and he says, okay, you did Franklin and Einstein, do me next. <laughs> My reaction is the same as yours. You arrogant little, you know. <laughs> and I say, well, I'll do you in 20, 30 years when you retire. Then I find out from somebody a few days later, hey, I said, well, I didn't know he had cancer. He said, well, he's keeping it secret, yeah. but he called you the day after his diagnosis. I said, okay, I'm gonna have to, I wanna do this. But when he talked to me, I said, why did you want me to do it? He said, because every book you've written has been about somebody who stands at the intersection of the humanities and the sciences. And he says, and that's where creativity occurs. Mm -hmm. That's what Franklin was, that's what Einstein was. And he said, you're gonna end up doing Leonardo at some point, mm -hmm. and that's why I thought of it, because Vitruvian man is almost that symbol of right. the intersection of the humanities and sciences. And if you ever saw one of uh, Jobs' product launches, the slide at the end would always be the street sign of the humanities uh -huh. and technology, or the humanities and the sciences. Because he said that separates us from Microsoft and everything else. We, we have that in our DNA. And so to me, that was the essence of Steve Jobs, a misfit. And if you remember his famous ad when he comes back to Apple, 
it's almost Leonardo-like. It's here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who think different. And he goes on, and uh, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And so it's all part of that theme. And I didn't quite realize I had a theme to my books until he told me. Well, you, you just answered the question. I was thinking, you know, we had, for instance, Ron Chernow here. Yeah. You know, you know Washington, Hamilton. You know, it, yeah. you, you can see, you tell, you knew what he was, what you, what to expect in the categories. Yours until you just defined it for us. I was going to say, you know, what, what, what's the theme of the pudding? Yeah, and you know, if you're an academic, you know that it's important to have a specialty. Yeah. But when I was growing up, when I went to Time Magazine for the first time, it was a general interest magazine. I can see people in the audience old enough to remember what that concept was all about. <laughs> and I was a floater. As I said to your class earlier, one week I'd look at the staff list, I'd be in the music, you know, hmm. writing music. Next week I'd be writing medicine, then math, then foreign policy, then, you know, theater. And so I jumped around a lot. And that was what Leonardo did. He loved every, he was the last person in history to try to learn everything you could possibly know about every subject uh -huh. that was knowable, from anatomy to zoology to art, you know, to music. And I think looking at those many diverse things in intersection, it gives you a different view than the specialist. So there are a lot of great, historians of our circle, meaning people I hang with. Meacham, uh -huh. Chernow, as you said, others, McCullough. Most of them have a specialty, you know, presidential historian, right. or in Chernow's case, you know, both in terms of American leaders like that. I. It probably would have been better if I had a specialty, but I love to leap around so I can write about everybody from a Steve Jobs to a Leonardo. Well, we're glad you did. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, because it, uh, one thing that's plainly common in these people is genius, whatever that yeah. uh, term is taken to mean. Um, t talk a little about the nature of genius. You know, I was reading particularly uh, your, your book about da Vinci uh, got me thinking because in other places, yeah. writing about other people, genius has been, people trying to pin this elusive uh, quality down have said it, it has to do with the ability to concentrate with great fixity on a, on a goal and exclude other things. In fact, that may be why it borders up on you know, the various things, mental disorders or obsessive compulsive Absolutely. behavior or things like that. And there seem to be examples of people whose brilliance and breakthroughs came from that. And yet, I, I, I was, I was really right. reluctant. Yeah, I know. I was reluctant to I think, and I hope our students don't all read this book. It is a 20 life lessons of Da Vinci. It's got things like procrastinate and get distracted, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> He's not always yet. putting that. I mean, he has more unfinished paintings than pen, finished yeah. paintings. So He's yeah, always his, putting things aside, sort of a perfectionist. Well, a couple things about genius. First of all, I don't think there's one particular nice. formula. Secondly, we think of genius as being really, really smart. There's students here, here's what we forgot to tell you. It ain't about being smart. Smart people are a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. You've met a lot of them in various parts of your career. They don't usually amount to much, right? Mm -hmm. It's creative people, imaginative people, right. who amount to something. People can think different, as Steve Jobs would say. Steve Jobs, I don't know if we're being recorded, but I don't know if we care. Um, he was not nearly as smart or as, you know, mental processing as Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. You'd watch the two of them, Bill Gates is like Larry Summers smart. Mm -hmm. But Bill Gates creates the Zoom. I don't know if anybody remembers the Zoom, but it was the MP3. It looked like it was made in Uzbekistan in a basement. <laughs> and Steve, at the same time, creates the iPod, which looks gorgeous. Why? Because he was creative. He was imaginative. So to me, that's an element of genius. Genius means thinking out of the box to me. It means right. being able to make a leap that's not just smart, but creative and imaginative. That often, to me, comes from seeing the patterns across different disciplines. 
right before Einstein can get the theory of general relativity, the most beautiful theory in the history of science, he's totally stumped, things aren't quite working, he pulls out his violin every day and plays Mozart and says it connects him to the harmonies of the spheres and he eventually gets it. Leonardo likewise can't do St. Jerome in the wilderness and if you go to New York they brought it from the Vatican, it's at the Met for the next couple of months. But he ends up dissecting the human body until he can have an understanding of muscles and he goes back to work on it again. So jumping from discipline to discipline tends to help. The other thing I don't want your students to read, and so close your ears here on this, <laughs> if you look at Leonardo and you look at Steve Jobs and you look at Ben Franklin and you look at Einstein, well, Einstein a little bit different, what do they have in common? They all drop out of school. This is why I don't get asked to do graduation <laughs> speeches. Um, because they're rebellious. Yeah. And it does help to be a bit rebellious. Uh -huh. Now, when I talk about that, I've sometimes done that. I think I saw it on, maybe I'm repeating what I said up there, because I saw they were using some old loops. But one of those speeches I talked about this with Einstein and how he was always thinking out of the box. I mean, other people were trying to figure out, why is the speed of light always constant? I mean, it's, if you're going towards the source, it should come at you faster. And he finally makes this leap that, okay, speed of light is always constant, but time is relative, depending on your state of motion. Well, that's a hugely creative leap. So somebody comes up to me after the audience of one of these things, it was the Miami Book Fair, I think I was looking at it in the corner, he says, hey, I'm just like Einstein. I look at this person, I go, oh yeah, uh-huh. So why? He says, he, he says, uh, cause I think out of the box. I said, yeah, but he knew what was in the box before he got out of it. <laughs> Don't try this at home. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, not to detour, but I, I thought it was so sadly ironic that Steve Jobs um, uh, eschewed modern science Ooh. with regard to his illness. Uh, he could have, if, if he'd stayed in, if he'd stayed in the box medically and st instead of what, spending a lot of time on, yeah. on uh, let's say, unproven uh, approaches, we might still have him or we'd have had him longer. We'd have had him longer. It wasn't just that. One of the things you talk about on genius is this persistence. And for Steve, it was a reality distortion field is what the people who work with him called it. Meaning, Steve would, something would be impossible. Steve would say, no, we're gonna walk through that wall or whatever. And you know whether it was uh, shaving 20 seconds on the boot up time of the original Mac or making a perfect piece of glass, he would stare at people and say, don't be afraid, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Unblinking, because he had a guru in India who taught him how to do that. So, and they kept saying it was a reality distortion. And then half the time he got it to work. Mm -hmm. The Mac boots up faster than you know an IBM PC. Uh, the I Phone is an amazing piece of art. But the reality distortion field did not work on cancer. Mm -hmm. And he kept just denying it, yeah. just saying, well, I'm not going to deal with it. It will go away if I eat, as one of his, Bill Campbell said, uh, excuse my language, you know, horse shit and horse shit roots or something. I mean, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I bumbled the words because I don't want to say them, but they were really furious because he was just eating all these weird organic things. Um, you have, uh, from play, uh, time to time, uh, cautioned, and as, I, as more people should, uh, uh, people looking at history today, again, su superimposing today's morality right. and today's codes on uh, times long gone. Um, it's a wonderful the thing to think about as a history professor. And my views on it evolve some. I call it the Jefferson conundrum, and Meacham and I talk about it a lot, because our views on Thomas Jefferson have evolved somewhat. However, you don't throw out, you know, you got two buckets. One is we hold these truths, and the other is all men are created equal. He kind of messes up the second, but he's got the first down pat. And you gotta be able to take a person as a whole. And that was an interesting thing about the Jobs book even, because he was a real jerk. Mm -hmm. And they have a technical term in Silicon Valley for that begins with an A. <laughs> but, you know, but you have to say, okay, you take the good with the bad. And you know, I'll let you do the thought experiment, but I um, 
first wrestled with it in real seriousness uh, with Kissinger, obviously, because I think he was a true genius in thinking out of the box and doing the triangular balance mm -hmm. that helps us get out of Vietnam. But obviously, he had a lack of moral sentiment, as he would say, in the conduct of foreign policy. Uh, but I particularly wrestled with it publicly in New Orleans when I came back a few years ago. And I was asked by Mitch Landrew, your namesake is uh, Mitch, uh, who was the mayor, to be co-chair of our tricentennial. And the other co-chair was Wynton Marsalis, the cornetist and trumpeter mm -hmm. at Jazz at Lincoln Center. So Wynton calls me up and says, I'll do it if you do it. And I said, sure. He said, but one condition. I said, what? And he said, you help me convince Mitch to take down Robert E. Lee. Now, Lee was in Lee's circle right at the end of St. Charles Avenue. And I said, uh, went and I said, yeah, do you mind? You know, it's, you know, everybody knows that statue. And I said, I've driven around that statue thousands of times. I never pause to think about who's on top of that plinth. Long pause, he says, I do. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, let me think about this differently a little bit. So Robert E. Lee is somebody who had many, as President Trump has said, you know, many strong, great qualities, but also was on the wrong side of history. I can see why the monument was put up. It was actually, I mean, Lee never had anything to do with New Orleans. The Army of Northern Virginia wasn't down there, you know, and New Orleans, smartly or dumbly, had surrendered on day two of the war, and so <laughs> General Butler occupied us the whole time. And, uh, but, so he was just put up in the 1890s after Plessy v. Ferguson, after Reconstruction, <laughs> to sort of be a symbol of whatever. And so I said, all right, it's time now. It's been a century. It was okay to have him up for a century. He doesn't have to be up for another two or three centuries. We have to reevaluate in the light of the current day without being too much guilty of presentism, who do we want to have on our yeah. pedestals? Yeah. And um, I think we have to understand, say, Jefferson in his time, but you also have to put him in a context a context in which a lot of people there kept slaves, especially the Virginia presidents, but others freed the slaves when he didn't. Right. He didn't. And secondly, Ben Franklin had two slaves and was so close to Jefferson. And then realized, Franklin did, he kept a chart, Franklin, of all the errors he had made, errata right. during his life, and then how he had rectified it. And the great errata he had made was once when he was young having two household slaves. Mm -hmm. So he becomes the founder of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery as his way of rectifying it. Well, in history, as a historian, without being guilty of presentism, you can say, here's where the arc of history went. Mm -hmm. These people are on the right side, and these people got it wrong. And so I think we have to apply some moral judgment, but like everything, like Ben Franklin teaches us, it's a balance. Yeah. You don't go off the deep end on either way. Well, I, just, I think that uh, you, you uh, have just reflected what I think have to be the two preconditions to reaching such a judgment today. One is actual historical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people you know, condemning this and that with, who clearly don't, don't know the history yeah. and, the, and the complexities and the nuances. And then you know, a sense of empathy. That, you have uh, to have a sense of empathy you also have to have a sense of understanding. Mm -hmm. And you have to avoid what we have too much of today, which is absolute knee-jerk fanatic, you know, yeah. that you're, to I mean, the, what I call 140-character problem, which is you're, <laughs> I got to do a tweet. I know I'm right. I'm going to blast things. Right. I make my history students at Tulane. You probably don't have as much of it here at Purdue because you're, but, you know, we're down south. Find a building at Tulane and make the argument for and against taking the uh, name off uh, or whatever. Whether it's Eddie Abair, who you probably remember vaguely, he was yeah. a con. But um, one of the interesting ones is Edward B. White, Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice of the United States from Louisiana, and he's in front of the Louisiana Supreme Court, where he had been Supreme Court Justice of Louisiana and then goes on to become in the United States. He votes on what we will now say is, without mm -hmm. doubt, the wrong side mm -hmm. of Plessy v. Mm -hmm. Ferguson. 
And so everybody says, we got to take down the statue. Well, the statue is there because, not because of his vote on Plessy, but because of being head of the Louisiana Supreme Court. And I said, and by the way, I want you to read his decision in U.S., I mean, the United States versus U.S. Steel, mm -hmm. where he breaks up the trusts and he says that huge monopolies and trusts crush the ability of the common man mm -hmm. to have good jobs at good wages. And I want you to understand the fullness of his life and say, okay, he was wrong on Plessy, but he was very progressive when it came to some things. Our job as historians sometimes is to complexify, yeah. meaning, hey, it's more complex. Yeah, takes 145 characters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to spend just a few quick min minutes. It's, it's, it, you, you, you're, you're so unusual in so many ways, but, um, but uh, as the editor of Time Magazine, and I think I saw somewhere in their first fledgling digital, you yeah. were part of their first digital venture, whatever that amount to. You were also the uh, CEO and chairman of CNN. So you're one of those people who has lived through an incredibly and such a swift transformation in the way we receive our, our uh, uh, information, uh, print, electronic, and digital. You know, what's that My ride, what's that ride been like? Though. <laughs> I ran Time Magazine in the 90s when we were making huge sums of money and the internet comes along and new companies like petfood.com are like taking spread, you know, two-page ads in the magazine and as soon as I leave, you know, yeah. print journalism goes down the tank because uh, the internet makes everything for free, at least in the 90s and 2000. Um, it, it was interesting because I'll give the broad brush answer. The good side and the bad side was that in our, I'll speak almost for this whole auditorium, day and generation, which means from the end of World War II to 2000, there was an anomaly, which was big mainstream press. In Ben Franklin's day, there were like 5,000 people in Philadelphia, and there were 14 newspapers. But when we were growing up, there were three networks, let's say, three news magazines, three national newspapers, whatever. And there were gatekeepers mm -hmm. who could sort of say, well, that's not fair to a Mitch Daniel, or that's not, you know, and we weren't totally right. There were biases, but there was just a general sense, partly an economic sense, that if there are three news magazines or three networks, you've got to get a more than a third of the viewership or audience if you're going to succeed. But when it gets to narrow casting, when there are now 500 cable channels and 500 talk radio you know, stations and 1,000 blogs and blogospheres and internet publications, you just got to get 1% of the audience. Uh -huh. And so you have to go for a more passionate, and that means more ideological thing. So I was there when we were trying to hold the center at CNN, and I finally left because I knew the center wasn't going to hold. Uh -huh. that cable, you had to become ideological to get your core audience. And so I think the business model of journalism sort of collapsed at that point. And it wasn't evil, insidious journalists doing it. It was almost the technology mm -hmm. and the fate of having thousands of channels and things like that. I feel that there is still room in our society for what I would call the common ground. Mm -hmm. What I hoped, I mean, Time Magazine, you may think it was mainstream media, it was liberal, but no, it was run by Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce, both Claire Booth Luce, a very conservative Republican, mm -hmm. Henry Luce, a Republican, and it was considered sort of in the center then. It was for Wendell Wilkie, that type of thing. It was an enormous force in both the White Houses where I worked, and especially in the first one, the, the a key question every Friday is, what are, the, what are Time and Newsweek and US, sometimes U.S. News going to put on their cover this weekend? There'd be an advanced copy, as I recall, yeah. on Sunday or Saturday no, night or something. Yeah, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night. you'd get and, the advanced copy with yeah. the press release. We'd have it, yeah, messenger and, and to the White House. And that would absolutely dictate what the Sunday talk shows were going to concentrate absolutely. on. And that would dictate Monday's headlines. And it would dictate and, Monday's water cooler, if I could call it yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You go to work, you're mm -hmm. hanging around, and everybody has 
a common set of information. Mm -hmm. If you go to the water cooler, you go to the talk shows, whatever, there's no common information. Right. Somebody who's been watching Sean Hannity gets to a water cooler and somebody who's been watching Rachel Maddow right. over the weekend, they don't even share the same set of facts. Right. And yeah, you know, and as Moynihan used to say, you're yeah. entitled to your own opinion, but not your own fact. Mm -hmm. That's what we now have in the media. And Time and Newsweek and I think the others tried to have that common yeah. ground where you check the fact. I was telling the class earlier, I can tell you the hour that that ended. I was editor of Time. The Monica Lewinsky affair broke, 1990-something mm -hmm. or other. Um, Newsweek was ahead of us on it. You can always tell what your rival is doing. You interview, oh yeah, the people at Newsweek just came in. Boy, they actually know three other people who've heard the, you know, and you go, oh my God, we're behind Newsweek. I'm throwing every reporter we have to try to get that story, whatever Bill Clinton did, you know, et cetera. It comes around to be late Friday night, you know, early Saturday morning. And I got all my editors there and I say, we can't run the story. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. We have nobody on the record. People say, oh, but Newsweek's got it. We're going to look silly. Newsweek's going to beat us. I said, yeah, but I can't run this story. We don't have yeah. it nailed. I wait for that moment when the magazines come, as I said, and Newsweek doesn't run it. And the editor in charge then was Evan Thomas, who had been with me at time and was my co-author on The Wise Men. Right. So I was like personal, rivalry. So I pick up the phone and call Evan and say, what happened? He said, we held it. We just couldn't pin it down. Go to sleep. Five the next morning, the phone rings. It's the news desk. Have you seen the Drudge Report? And the Drudge had put the entire Newsweek Killed story uh -huh. on. And that's when we no longer had the power right. to say, this story is not nailed down yet because you knew it would run yeah. somewhere. No, I don't want to be uh, subject to fogeyism, but it's very, very hard to believe that the net, with all the gains that have come, that the net is not negative when, when there are not uh, flinty-eyed editors like you insisting on quality control and on on sources I would not have and all the rest. accepted your invitation if you were going to ban fogeyism. Oh. <laughs> so I'm going to agree with you. Yeah. And as I said to your class, it's not just that. I mean, it used to be, I still remember 9 11 being in the newsroom with Ted Turner at CNN, you know, when I was running, and said, okay, we can't put out what this is until we totally nail it down. Get, this is bigger than anything else, yeah. meaning we can't get this one wrong. So, Nowadays, the fact that you don't try to get it right, you just try to get it out there and then you correct it, is bad. But the other thing that's bad is social media, meaning Facebook, Twitter, that sort of thing, is both anonymous, you can't trace back who really sent you something or who made something up, and it incents, by its algorithm, it incents engagement and enragement. In, if something gets shared a lot, it goes right. to the top of the feed in Twitter or Facebook, and what gets shared is not, well, there's a complex call on what you should do with gun control. It's, can you believe what Hillary Clinton did to this cat or something? <laughs> so I think social media and the, and the lack of controls on the internet the line of the goodness that came from that, because frankly, it was kind of bad with plenty old, and I'll you know say it, old editors controlling what you got to hear. It was kind of good that the monopoly of the that's the way it is, Cronkite's got broken, but then it just got too broken, and the lines have now crossed. I'm going to ask Walter one more question, which is uh, your notice to come to the mics if uh, if you have uh, questions of your own. Uh, this will give you just a, a couple minutes to do that, so please take advantage. Um, something completely different. One of the public services to which he's been called, and this, these have included uh, you know, the Board of Broadcasting Governors and uh, national appointments. President Obama appointed you, I think, to that. But um, in your hometown of New Orleans, after the unforgettable tragedy of Katrina uh, many years ago now, um, you were 
helped lead the Reconstruction Louisiana Recovery Authority, uh, yeah. authority. And I'm just curious about that. Tell us about your hometown now. And I, I want to ask it in the context of a, of a, a book that uh, always uh, stuck with me. Mansur Olson wrote a book in which he attempted to demonstrate uh, that uh, the fastest growing and sometimes most creative and successful societies followed a cataclysm of some kind. San Francisco fire, massive defeat in war, Germany, Japan, post-World War II, things like that. And a lot of evidence for that, that, that these sweep away encumbrances to change and new ideas that, that a, any society builds up, uh, incumbent uh, yeah. you know, institutions. Um, have you seen any of that in New Orleans? And how oh, is, totally. How's it going? Totally, and it, I don't want to say it in a way that sounds callous because mm -hmm. storm was horrible. Right. But you had to make sure that we didn't screw it up. And our first decision was we're not going to try to rebuild the city the way it was. We're going to rebuild it the way it should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean sweeping away all the old, because part of what New Orleans is is 300 years of history in the mm -hmm. French. So it's preserving what's good. But the school system, let's just take one example. Yeah. You can pick anything you want, but schools was one of the ones I did. Was, all right, it was a really bad school system. We have this one chance. What we did, and this was before everything became politicized, we decided that one reason school systems are bad is they're monopolies. <clears throat> No, you know, if a, if a Whole Food moves in next to a Safeway and it's got a salad bar, the Safeway's got to up its game and you got competition. Schools don't have competition. So we, out of the 102 schools in New Orleans, decided, and it is still this way, that it's all charter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you sort of have half charters and one third charters, but they can't skim the cream. There's a common app. Mm -hmm. Charter schools have to take, parents get one of their top three choices. If parents aren't choosing your school, you don't have students. Right. If your students dwindle, it's like Purdue. People right. choose Indiana, no, that they wouldn't, or Vanderbilt, never. Uh, but well, <laughs> good point, but bad choice. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Y'all will play in Vanderbilt <laughs> soon, I think. But, but you know, if you screw up here, parents and kids don't choose you. So we have a system of choice in which people apply, they got their top three choices. Generally, I mean, there's a few exceptions. Uh, you have to take special ed. You can't skim the cream. But you had competition. So the first thing that happens is in my neighborhood of Broadmoor, right in the heart of the city, part of the central city, neighborhood I grew up and moved back to, um, there were three schools. And one of them, uh, Forche, said, OK, we're going to stay up until 6 PM. Why? Because it's idiotic to throw a kid out in the street, especially in New Orleans, at 3 in the afternoon. So when it stayed open till 6, the other two schools <laughs> is like the Safeway, saying, hey, we're going to stay open till midnight. So they both did. Many, even little things. Alice Waters came from San Francisco in one of the schools and planted a garden. And, the, and so the school had a garden where they grew their own vegetables and cooked them. The other two schools and neighborhoods have to follow suit. They've got to compete. So now we have a school system. The charter bit is not that important. That's become a loaded word. But it's all parental choice, right. where, and you have autonomy at each school to decide the length of the day. It's complicated. You have to have, make sure we have standardized tests so we, p parents can compare the schools. But, so we tried to reinvent something new. And now the New Orleans school system was the worst in Louisiana. Now it's graduating more than any other parish in Louisiana. It, the test scores have gone from, you know, like in the 30 percentile up to the 70 percentile. Now, I mean, that's just one thing. But another thing that's happening across America is not just New Orleans, but you're happening here. Good creative towns have become magnets for talent. And you see that in Chattanooga. You see it in Nashville. You know, you see it here. Um, and so we have to figure out how do we stay a magnet for talent. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we've got a, a question. I'll, yes, sir. I'll, I'll give the usual admonition. Questions, not speeches. And, I get to and do the ben, speeches. Please identify yourself. No, it's, it's not a speech. Um, but, my name is Mason Wiss. And, um, Hi, Mason. I had some questions um, about uh, your writing about Henry Kissinger. And 
Uh, you have to remember, I was about your age when I wrote that book, so you have to remind me <laughs> I, I'll, some, I'll, some I'll of it. I'll um, yeah. any harsh criticisms, but I, I do have some questions. You, uh, I read what I could of it um, yeah. after I heard that you were coming. Uh, yeah. I wasn't able to finish it. I was able to read excerpts, mm. though, and uh, through what I read and uh, interviews I was able to watch of you around right. when the book came out, um, I never saw you call Henry Kissinger a war criminal, and I never saw you accuse him of genocide. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if You're that, right. um, That's right. was an attempt to avoid presentism, as you were talking about today, and bias. And if you think that in avoiding those uh, yeah. adjectives, you achieved well, that? Well, no, I you... would have used the adjective if I felt he was a war criminal. And I looked at Chile, part of the book nobody reads, and I looked at the secret bombing of Cambodia, and looked at what, you know, what happened, and I am deeply, deeply critical of what went on there. I don't think that it's particularly enlightening when you slap a label. Now, I've slapped labels. Occasionally now I even slap the label racist, which is up there with war criminal, not on Henry Kissinger. But, but I'm pretty careful when I write not to let labels distract you rather than have you learn exactly what happened with the bombing of Cambodia. Now, the genocide that you might talk about was, as you know, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge doing it in Cambodia to Cambodians. There was also the genocide and it in East was part Timor. Sorry? There's also the genocide in East Timor committed by the Indonesians, which... Right, and both of part. them were not done by America, but you could argue, correctly perhaps, that the consequences, say, of the uh, secret invasion of Cambodia led to the rise of Pol Pot, which led to the genocide. Likewise, in East Timor. You could argue that even though the Americans didn't do it, American actions were deeply mistaken and led to horrible consequences. And if you want to make that argument, my book's the best place to do it, because <laughs> that's the argument I make. But that doesn't mean I slap the label war criminal for having done the invasion of Cambodia, even though it led to really bad consequences. Right. And so did East Timor, right. you're right. Generally it requires intent, and bad judgment is something short of intent. Right, and um, war criminal is a very specific term of art. I mean, there's a whole literature on what constitutes a war crime. And uh, you could make an argument that in an unintended consequences of what he did, that would still rise to the level of war crime. But that's where you don't find that in my book, because I don't actually believe that. Thank you, Mason. Thanks, good, Mason. Good that question. was a good question. Let's, let's go over here. Hi. Um, a few years ago, Jeff Bezos purchased the Washington Post yeah. last year. Mark Benioff purchased your former employer. I'm yeah. just interested what your thoughts are on these technology oligarchs. Well, uh, I. Um, this is nothing new. I mean, all sorts of wealthy people in the past have bought, you know, I mean, newspapers and outlets because they, you know, but it's something that's, we've had a resurgence of it. I couldn't figure out 10 years ago, what's the business model going to be for journalism? Because it's, advertising's not working in the age of the internet. Subscriptions are not working when everybody thinks all content's supposed to be free. I never came up with the notion of egotistical billionaires buying it <laughs> for their own reason. But that's a brilliant solution, especially if it's a Benioff, who I actually like a whole lot, and a Bezos, who seems, leave aside his personal life at the moment, seems like he's not doing it for insidious reasons. There are times when the billionaire egotist who buys it can be a problem. I mean, I grew up with Marty Peretz owning the New Republic, and you could argue that one either way. Murdoch owning Fox, et cetera. But benign billionaires is a good business model. And uh, I remember when Time was going on, and people said, oh, what's going to happen with Time, you know, and Time Inc. has collapsed, whatever. 
they called me. They said, find me a billionaire. And I went around. I talked to David Rubenstein. You probably know half the people I talked to. I said, hey, don't you want to own a news magazine? You can get it pretty cheap. And uh, it finally got to Benioff and like, bingo, yay. <laughs> Thank you. Great yeah. question. Let's, let's move quickly. We only got a little bit of time. So I'm this sorry, is a follow-up question uh, that you mentioned about the New Orleans public yes. school system. Do you worry that a school system will have the same pressures to narrow cast just like cable news channels? Yeah, every year we have to refine how it works in a school system. And one of the things you have to do is say you can't skim the cream, you can't just pick and choose who gets to come to school. It's done by lottery, but if people aren't wanting to come to your school, you're gonna end up shutting down because you don't have enough people coming. But things happen, like there's school, the uh, bricolage school, which teaches in French. All right, is that, how good is that, how bad is that? We try to make sure they're racially balanced in some ways. If you're totally racially imbalanced either way, we say, you know, we're not trying to have quotas or anything, but maybe you're not doing something right here. Also, I'll give you one example. It's not quite up what you said, which is um, a friend of mine, Ben Markovich, did Collegiate Academy. It was wonderful. It was in the FEMA trail for a while, but it's still the best school. Some of the kids I mentored, I made them go to Collegiate. One of them's at Yale now. But he suspended kids. They had to walk along the line. They had to wear a uniform. They had to, and if you did something wrong twice or whatever, you were suspended. And it got to be pretty bad. And somebody was writing an article saying, hey, they're just suspending more people than any other school. And Ben called me up and said, can you get them to stop that article? And I said, well, let's look at it. And I said, well, wait, that article's true. I'm not going to get them to stop it. And I said, he said, well, we have to suspend people because if they're troublemakers, it ruins the whole school. I said, what good are you doing putting a kid on the street at 11 a.m. because they didn't walk them? I said, why don't you make a pledge? Next year, no suspensions. He said, well, how will we do that? I said, we'll raise money. We got Mike Bloomberg to his foundation to pay for it, to have an in-house place, a suspension room with counselors and all there. So there's a lot of things that go wrong when you allow school autonomy and choice. And each year, I mean, I just came from a meeting on Monday of New Schools New Orleans, and we have 12 other problems like that. But, but it's still worth the effort because we didn't need to go back to the school system we had before the storm. Let's go over here. Um, hello. Um, so this is just a quick question because you brought up an excellent point when you, excuse me, you brought up an excellent point when you brought up the Hannity versus Maddow example because sometimes, um, yeah, it is difficult to go through the news without getting agenda after agenda. So my question would be, when you're going through a particular piece looking for facts, especially for, I speak for everyone who academic curriculum requires this, what kind of facts are you trying to keep your eyes out for? and um, how do you know if something is fact versus agenda? You know, I think we're all smart enough to, with a good smell test that, you know, uh, it's sometimes hard on the internet. I was watching some video that had gone viral where somebody had thrown something in the car. And I said, you know what? And it was another one I saw with a basketball player got beaten by a girl. I said, those are two fake stage videos. I know that they're just to rile people up on the internet. But it's, you know, I can pull out my phone and show you, you know, here's my news diet in any given late night. I tend to do it at midnight before I go to sleep. It's the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, sort of the mainstream. But it's Vox. I do the Daily Caller as well as the Huffington Post, you know, try to get both sides. But as I look at a fact, I've triangulated it enough. I've read four or five different sources, even on complex things like Boris Johnson deciding to expel Winston Churchill's grandchild from the Conservative Party, which I find rather amusing. You know, I'm like, all right, let me drill down on this. Let me see what the Telegraph, which is a more Tory-oriented paper in England. I've already read the Daily Mail, and I've read New York Times on it. So I think you do what you do in life. You're sitting there at dinner, at the dining room table here, and somebody tells you something, every now and then you're gonna check, hey, that really happened. And even people who try to tell the truth, Brian Williams, I don't think meant to lie, but you, 
or Joe Biden for that matter. I don't think meant to mix up the stories he did in New Hampshire intentionally, but people get things wrong. You have to be non-judgmental. You have to say, you know, people just get things wrong, but let me, let me check it. Thank you. We're over time. I'm sorry. We'll take one more question. And well, I'm, uh, I'm happy to stay if you want. For a... Well, you've got to be in class tomorrow. I don't All right. I'll, uh, I'll do it real quick. In fact, if you want to let three questions hit me, and then I'll have, pick the Those one that I most want to answer. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> that way, I'll only answer one. I'm the one eating up the time. Hi. So uh, you mentioned the idea of kind of um, thinking outside the box and uh, the scientific method, which um, mm -hmm. one of the biggest premises is to not take assumptions and not take things as is. What do you think is the best way um, that you've seen uh, among the research that you've done that people build that type of mindset? Because I think it's one that doesn't, at least I've seen uh, in many people, doesn't come naturally. So how do you really get the mindset of not taking things as is and really thinking deep into them? Next question, too. I'm going I'm to actually take all three. Hi, my name is Rajiv. So I really uh, liked your book on, called Innovators. It's like you studied a group of hackers and talk about the digital revolution. So like you've seen, you've, you've studied a lot of history and seen the revolution of this, like the digital revolution. So where do you think with the AI and the space travel, where do you think the future is headed? And then what's your thoughts on mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk or the AI and the really big debate on AI with uh, good evening. So among these men who stand at the intersection of sciences and humanities, would you say with your reference to social media that, <clears throat> that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is among them? Is he a, does he qualify to be one of these geniuses, in, to use your words? Okay, I'm going to do it real quick in reverse order. No on Mark Zuckerberg. He should be better. He should have stayed and studied more of the humanities courses. He shouldn't have dropped out. Had he had a good sense of the humanities, he would not be making Facebook the insidious force it now is in our society. Well uh, said. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't think he's a bad person. I just think that he doesn't get it the way Steve Jobs did and others. Uh, on AI and other things, here's the key. Stand at this intersection. Machines are not going to replace us. The history of the digital revolution, starting with Ada Lovelace, is the combination of human creativity with machine processing power. There are people like Elon who think the machine processing power will someday get so great it won't need our creativity anymore. But if you look at the line for the past 130 years, it's the people who have done the interface between humans and machines, i.e. the Apple iPhone, whatever. That's where the power has lain, is with those who believe the connection of humans uh, to their machines um, will be better than machines that go without humans. And as to your question, there's just a simple answer. You have to be a little bit rebellious. I made fun of the fact that Steve Jobs drops out of school, Ben Franklin runs away, Einstein, you know, Leonardo, all that. They're all a bit rebellious. They're willing to question authority. This is not something you should do every day at Purdue, <laughs> but every now and then, when somebody says, you know, the speed of light is always constant, it moves through an ether, and or says like Newton does, the first sentence of the Principia, time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it. And you got a patent clerk, Einstein, who can't get a job, so he's a third class clerk in a patent office. He's looking at the first sentence of the greatest you know, piece of science ever written up until then, time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it. And he says, how do we know that? How would we test that? How would we test that if two people are moving really fast, would they see the time the same way? Nobody thought of questioning the premise upon which Newton had started the Principia, but this patent clerk thinks different. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was, I was, I was going to take responsibility, but if you're late to class tomorrow, it's on you now. So, you know, uh, I don't know about the, you. Too late doesn't begin. My class is till <laughs> noon. 
Well, it's like as uh, Senator Magnuson used to say that meeting doesn't start till I get there. Right. Uh, thank you all for coming. You know, uh, the, the term that's uh, drifted out of use generally, uh, Renaissance man, uh, but the species is clearly not extinct because there's at least one uh, extant in, in our time and you just heard from him. So thank you very much. Thank you.